When I was little, my parents divorced, and my mom got full custody of me, so I was living with her when this happened. My mom was extremely religious, and if you've ever seen Jesus Camp, that was pretty much the kind of environment I grew up in, sprinkled with a lot of mental abuse and a house that belonged on an episode of Hoarders. My mom homeschooled me through a religious program, half because she wanted to indoctrinate me and half because I know she didn't want me to have contact with adults outside the family that would report her. This was back in 2008-2009, and my mom had finally broken down and got me a computer since it had become increasingly necessary for school. My mom was pretty ignorant of the capabilities and also the dangers of the internet. She had bought it with antivirus software and thought that while protecting my computer, it would also prevent me from being able to do much else on the internet. Because of this, she didn't really monitor my activity. I usually kept another tab open so I could quickly switch over to something harmless if she was around, but usually I would get on late at night when I knew she was sleeping. Fast forward a couple of months into me having my own laptop. I had discovered several online forums that interested me and had made accounts. Mind you, this was during the peak emo scene goth trend and, of course, I identified with the emo scene group. The main forum I frequented was a board geared towards emo teenagers. I'm not going to include the name of this forum for safety reasons, but it was similar to Vampire Freaks. Now this board was specifically geared toward teenagers and obviously most of the people on these forums were well under 18. The minimum age to create an account was 13 and I was just shy. I opted to lie about my age and say I was 15 because I didn't want members to think I was a child. Kind of funny now, and this is important for later. I would spend hours on this forum, browsing and talking to my fellow misunderstood emo comrades. I became pretty close to a group of people in this forum and ended up talking to them outside the forum through MSN Messenger virtually every day. Everything was pretty laid back and we mostly would talk about how awful our parents were and screamo bands that we loved. The group I was close with was mostly girls around my age and we would group chat over webcam often, so I knew these girls weren't old creeps. However, there was a guy in this group who always seemed kind of off but everyone chalked it up to him being awkward and harmless. I had talked to this guy a few times in passing in group chats, but never one-on-one. -on -one. That changed one night when this guy messaged me privately, telling me how depressed and upset he was because his girlfriend had just left him. He made several comments that insinuated that he was thinking of ending his own life. I panicked and did my best to comfort him and calm him down. After this conversation, he thanked me, told me how helpful I had been and how sweet I was. After this, the guy would not leave me alone and started messaging me every day. At this point, I didn't think much of it. I didn't have enough life experience for my red flags to start going off yet. And so begins one of the worst periods of my life. This guy was admittedly older than most people on the forum. He claimed to be in his early 20s and based on his appearance, I believe that much was true. He continued messaging me every day and we became pretty good friends. Every now and again he would say something that felt off, but I ignored it. Me, this guy, and a few other people were in a group chat one day. He said something funny and I jokingly responded with, Haha, I love you. That was it. That was all the fuel he needed. He immediately messaged me asking if I meant what I said and if I was serious. Uncomfortable, I tried pushing it off, but there was no use. He started posting on the forums that we were dating, calling me his girlfriend and even escalating to fiancé at one point. He kept messaging me, telling me he couldn't wait till I turned 18 and could move out to where he was on the west coast. By this time, I was around 14 and I knew something was off with this guy and I slowly started becoming less active on the forums and anytime I logged on to MSN Messenger, I would appear offline. He had sent me hundreds of emails asking where I was and they slowly became more threatening as time went on. I never responded to any of them but he continued to send them. He would tell me he was worried, then say he was going to find me because I belonged to him. Before long I became totally inactive on the forum and MSN and didn't even turn on my computer anymore. I thought if I distanced myself from the internet the issue would resolve itself. 
I had begun to forget about the whole ordeal until one day I went to check the mail. There was an envelope with no return address and it was addressed to me. Weird, I thought, but when I opened it there was a handwritten letter. It was from him. The letter basically went on to say that he was trying to save up enough money to buy a car so he could drive out to see me and bring me home with him. I honestly don't remember what else the letter said because I was so beyond horrified of what I was reading. I remember my entire body shaking with fear and panic and immediately ripping up the letter and burying it at the bottom of the trash can. Let me just say, I never even told this guy my whole first name. He knew my nickname, which is common amongst several names that are similar to mine, but mine itself is pretty unusual. I never told him my first name, let alone my last. I never gave him my address. He only knew the state I lived in. I know I never slipped up and told him or anyone else any of these things. I may have been young and dumb, but I still knew enough not to be telling people on the internet personal details. I lived in fear for years, really up until I moved away from that place. I was always looking over my shoulder, afraid he would show up at any time and do God knows what. A year or two after receiving this letter, I got a message from some woman on Facebook. This woman claimed that she was a friend of that guy and how she knew him personally. She basically wanted to say that I had broken his heart by leaving him and wished that I would give him another chance because he really is such a great guy. I panicked and blocked her without responding. To this day, I still believe it was him under someone else's name. It is important to note I listed my age as 15 when I joined this site. This guy was open about being older than me and would often joke about how I was jailbait. This form has since been taken down, but I recently looked it up using the Wayback Machine. I was able to find his profile and a lot of the posts that he had made previous to myself joining. He'd been very aggressively flirting with girls in the forum who were openly 14 and probably younger. He would call them his wives, and if they posted pictures, he would comment about how attractive they were. Looking back on that, being an adult makes my skin crawl. This guy was no doubt a predator and had been preying on young girls since he started the forum. This has been 11 years ago, and I don't think of it very often now. Occasionally, something will trigger a memory and I relive it for a bit and wonder what could have happened to me. I never told either of my parents. At the time, I felt the punishment from my mom would have been worse than whatever that creep had planned for me. I hope my story can serve as a warning to any young people that may read this. The internet has some very dark places hidden in plain sight. Please, be careful and protect yourself. Let me start off by saying I'm new to this sub, but not new to the channel. I actually listen daily on my night shifts, ironically. Because of this, I always remain vigilant. So for me, this is the scariest encounter I have had working retail. I'm 29 and have been working various retail jobs since finishing high school. Never have I had something bad ever happen other than the occasional rude customer. For context, I am female as well and very small, only about 5 foot, not intimidating at all. I moved back to my hometown of South Florida a few months ago from North Carolina. It was right before the pandemic blew up to give you a time reference. I of course needed a job to support my family and was living with my in-laws, husband and daughter. I was able to quickly get an interview with a gas station thanks to my mother-in-law. So I interview and get the job, and with this chaos going on, I was glad to have an essential job with full-time and decent pay. So far, I've been here for about two months and without any incident. It is important to know that I was originally hired for mornings, but have had to cover night shift temporarily for a co-worker on medical leave. I adapted to night shift as best as possible and get to know some of the regulars. In particular, one couple who fell on hard times would visit just about every night, and this is relevant for later. My gas station is locked during nights for safety, so I never felt threatened or anything. I only had to service customers through the window, so much safer and less risk. This particular night started out as planned and going smoothly. I had just finished all the stocking and cleaning. It was approximately 1am at this point when the story begins. 
A guy walks up and I greet him as usual. Hey, what can I do for you? He didn't respond for a minute and then asked, Can I get a hot dog with peppers? I reply, "Ah, I'm sorry, but we aren't serving hot dogs right now. This is the reason I brought up the pandemic, because we aren't serving any hot food due to contamination risk. He gets annoyed but starts to walk away. I thought to myself, Okay, just walk away, I guess. I started to turn to go about my shift when I hear a tap on the window. He has now come back again. I ask again. Hey, what's up? He begins to get very agitated and raises his voice. He says, What do you mean you don't got any hot dogs? Get me a hot dog with peppers. I again restate what I said earlier as polite as possible. You would think that that would be the end. So did I, but this was just the start. He keeps repeating this and then begins shouting, I can't believe it. She isn't giving me food, this little wench. It's relevant to know, I'm pretty passive. I mean, I will defend myself if needed, but I'm usually quiet. I stood there frozen and started to worry. Well, you better call the cops since you ain't getting my hot dog. He exclaimed angrily. I almost thought he was joking until I stared at his face. He was actually seriously upset. Then... I saw him walk off again toward one of the pumps, talking to, I assume, a friend getting gas. I even began to think how silly it was. Really? Upset over food? This made me begin to think he was under the influence with his irrational behavior. I wasn't calling the cops for that, no matter how much he asked. Anyways, a few minutes go by and he again comes back. Oh boy, here we go again, I thought and sighed to myself. I reluctantly opened the drawer to the window and, again, asked what he needed, getting fed up at that point but not really scared yet. Give me a steel reserve. Go get it now. He replied with emotion, gesturing, telling me where it was. I thought to myself, do I sell it to him? No, he's irrational. We can also deny sales if we feel someone is intoxicated or being threatening. I calmly tell him, I know where it is, but... I'm not serving you alcohol. He naturally asked why, and I replied, You're being irrational, rude, and threatening, so I don't have to sell you anything. That set him off, and this didn't surprise me, but I was trying to stand my ground. Listen here, fatty. You call the cops, and you see how much time I'm about to get for this. I'm seriously starting to panic at this point. Listen, if you don't leave, I will call the cops, I explained. He didn't seem to care and now began to bang on the glass. He kept exclaiming, You don't know anything. You're a bum. I'm beginning to shake and trying to stand my ground but extremely terrified. Supposedly these windows are reinforced but I didn't want to find out. He continued to ask me things like, Come on, how much money do you even make here? You're a bum. You don't know anything. I reply, It's irrelevant. I don't know you and it doesn't matter what you think of me. He kept calling me every profanity while continuing to bang on the window. At this point, he forced my hand and I knew to call 911. I pick up the phone to show him I'm serious and even tell him what I'm doing. A part of me didn't want to tell him because I wanted him to be caught, but I was so scared. I had never been that terrified in my life. Time felt slow as I explained to the dispatcher what was happening. He continued to bang and yell while I was on the phone, but I ignored him. My safety and any potential customers were my priority. I, of course, give a description, the address, etc. I always hear that time is slow or as it feels like forever when you're waiting for the cops. Well, it definitely does. I kept thinking, what if he has a weapon? What if another guy is in on it? So many thoughts racing and my panic is interrupted by more voices arguing. I looked to see my regulars, the couple I mentioned earlier, yelling at this guy. They heard the commotion when they were walking up and confronted him. This guy even had the audacity to try to grab the regular's wife. He said, Why don't you come with me to my hotel room? You can make me some money. I'm in 305. I thought her husband was going to pummel him and I was hoping so. I also was afraid for them because who knows if he has something on him. He was definitely on something for sure. They scare him off and he disappears behind the building. 
I thank them and they tell me they're glad that they can help and hopefully the police get him. They inform me he was staying in a nearby Days Inn based on what he said during this brief encounter. This hotel is within walking distance to my job so this is all terrifying. The police were great and responded quickly and went to check at the hotel. If anything, it hopefully scared him off because odds are they probably won't find him. Now with this just happening, I keep scanning all the windows wondering if he'll come back. Thankfully we do lock up at night because who knows what he would have done if he was inside. This is a long one that lasted the entirety of a school year, getting worse as the year went by. I met Brandon my senior year of high school. I was technically a junior, but I was graduating a year early. The only reason that is relevant is because that meant that I had a junior English class, which is where I met Brandon. Brandon was the obvious standout weird kid. He was easily over six foot tall and morbidly obese, with long black greasy hair and always had a death metal t-shirt on. As the weird kids always do, Brandon instantly took a liking to me. I was a bit of a weird kid myself, always wearing black with long red hair, piercings, contacts, and heels I'd wear. My family moved an average of every year and a half, so I was plenty used to changing schools and having to awkwardly try to make some sort of connection to someone to make the classes go by quicker. I knew better than to do that with Brandon. It would be social implosion, honestly. Luckily, we had assigned seats in that class, but unluckily, Brandon was seated no more than two desks away from me. I was seated with a girl named Alice, and we quickly became friends, often talking with Brandon intervening, even in conversations where it was obvious his opinion wasn't appreciated. But I tried to be a nice person, so I'd give small replies and talk politely, but I never encouraged or acknowledged his flirting. A few weeks into the school year, our teacher told us to get into groups of four with people closest to us to do a poster project. That meant that Brandon was doing the poster with us. Brandon immediately made it clear that he wasn't going to help at all, claiming he never did any of his work and that he wasn't about to start now. He instantly laid his head down on the desk, presumably trying to sleep. That annoyed me, Alice and the other guy, but we didn't say anything. Alice and I sailed through this class with ease and had to finish the project in less than half the class time, which gave us time to do whatever we wanted. Alice and I talked, and she brought up hanging out and asked for my number. I happily agreed, and immediately after, Brandon interjected. Can I have your number? Loud enough for the tables around us to turn and look. I couldn't help but scrunch up my face in distaste, but I have no backbone and don't want to be rude. Most of the kids in the class are to him, so I hesitate and say, Uh, I don't really text a lot. I mean, I'm really busy with work and school because I graduate this year, but... Uh, okay. But to be clear, I do not want a boyfriend at all. Just friends. He immediately laughs and says, I know that someone like you would never be with someone like me. As much as I wanted to say something nice, I knew better than to set myself up to compliment him. I shift my gaze and ask, Do you have your phone so I can put in my contact info? His eyes enlarge for a moment and says, No, can you just write it down for me? I frown, having seen him on his phone earlier, but just write down my number on a small ripped corner of paper, hoping he'll lose the slip. This is the beginning of the warning signs. Brandon had started following me out to the exit of the school a few days before, just with a tap on the shoulder and a quick, have a good day. But this is when it changed. As class lets out, I rush away, hoping to outrun Brandon from catching up. I'm holding my phone, texting my dad I'm about to head out of school to walk to work. That's when my phone beeps and it's a text from an unknown number. Got you. And before I have time to question it, I feel two hands clamped down on my shoulders. I was only 20 feet from the door, but of course, there was Brandon. He says it out loud then. Got you. And then laughs. I kind of half smile and nod. Are you heading to work now? I frown at the question, 
but I had talked to Alice in class about my job at the gas station down the road from school, so I figured that's how he knew. Uh, yeah, Brandon. It's great not having a last period, though. I say half-heartedly. He just stands there, full-on grinning at me, menacingly. After an awkward moment, I say, Shouldn't you get to class? And he scoffs. <laughs> no rush. I have auto mechanics. The teacher doesn't care if we're late. Well, as you said, I, I have to get to work, so bye, Brandon. Goodbye, Victoria. I'll text you and see you very soon. And with that, he shuffled away. Even though I didn't know it then, this would become a daily occurrence. I would rush out of class, and no matter what, Brandon would catch up and try to keep me. As I'd find out later, Brandon's teacher did care if he was late and had given Brandon detention multiple times and threatened to suspend him if he kept it up. Brandon supposedly assured him he wouldn't care, and I also found that his class was located on the exact opposite side of the school where I left, which gave him even less justification for following me. Over the days, Brandon would continually text me and send me memes after school, some violent and some pretty intimate. I'd yell at him and tell him to stop, but other than that, I might respond once or twice a week to his mass of messages. That never stopped him from sending 10 plus messages a day. I silenced this conversation and really didn't think about it or him if I could avoid it. Brandon would stare at me creepily in class, with multiple students noticing it and pointing it out loudly with a laugh, though that wouldn't stop him. There was a few times Brandon lost his cool in class and would begin screaming curses and throwing things like his backpack and notebooks. Brandon would always be back the next day though, which he explained to me was because the school was well aware of the abusive home life he had and they know if they suspended him, he'll just drop out of school. But Brandon began being more violent with me. It was our last day in school before winter break when a boy from our class asked me out in front of Brandon and it visibly angered Brandon who immediately stood up, which caused the desk to loudly lurch forward. You're not worthy of her. No one is. If you touch her or talk to her again, I'll rip your spine out and will beat you with it. The whole class became silent and was staring. My teacher had overheard this and immediately yelled at him, telling him he needed to apologize. He just flipped off the class, not looking at me, and stormed out. With that, the boy looked at me bewildered and I politely turned him down. Class wasn't even five more minutes, so I left like normal, already forgetting the Brandon drama and feeling excited because it was finally winter break and I had like two weeks to spend my evening smoking and listening to Let's Read podcasts. I had stepped out of the glass doors when my thoughts were abruptly interrupted. Brandon stood by the bench right outside of the school staring at me. I was the only person I knew who got off early without having a car and the student parking lot was on the other side of the school, so it was only the two of us. I was so startled to see him that the first thing I blurted out was, What are you doing, Brandon? You still have another class, don't you? He didn't respond, so I continued. And what was up with you blowing up in class like that? I'm a big girl. I'm even older than you. I don't need you trying to protect me. It's weird. He merely blinked and began walking towards me with a cold look on his face. I hate school. I don't care about that. I care about you. I could kidnap you, you know. When you close on Fridays, I could just come up behind you and shove you in a van. I didn't know where to start on that one. How did he know I closed on Fridays? Had I ever told Alice that? I didn't think so and I definitely had never told Brandon that. I don't know why I reacted this way, but my reaction was to laugh and say, If you really care about me, please don't kidnap me now. We're just about to be on break. Kidnap me on Monday or something when we're back at school. He was only a few feet away from me now, and he continued staring at me. He then rushed forward and tried to grab me. He grabbed both my arms and tried to wrap his arms around me. As I said, he's at least six foot and morbidly obese while I'm quite the opposite at a petite five foot three and 95 pounds. Don't touch me, Brandon! My struggle was useless as he holds me and whispers, 
and it'll be like this always, soon. And he let me go as the bell rang. He just takes a step back and watches as I begin running away as fast as I can, constantly looking back. Brennan didn't text me for a few days until Christmas Eve when I noticed that he had texted me a few hours earlier. Do you think if I ask Santa for you this year he'll kidnap you for me? So I responded, no, especially if I ask Santa for a restraining order on you. Less than a minute later he sent a frowny face in response. After break I returned to school so motivated to get the next few months over so that I can finally be free. I don't think about Brandon until the sixth period that day as I take my seat. Before class starts with no sign of Brandon, I decided to see if Brandon had sent me anything over break after the frowny face. My eyes enlarged in disbelief. I have 50 plus unread messages, starting from hey and quickly escalating to I just sold my soul to Satan so that I could have you as my slave. I'll take good care of you. Alice walks in and notices my look of disbelief and all I can do to respond is to hand her my phone, showing all of the crazy messages and pictures he had sent me. Alice and I don't have time to talk about it when the bell rings and I put my phone away. Brandon walks in a few minutes later, this absolute look of hate on his face. My teacher tries asking him where he's been, but... He ignores her and sits down, head turned so that he's directly giving me that cold, hard look. Alice looks as scared as I do and my teacher is still yelling at him but he completely is tuning her out, head cocked like in a horror movie staring blankly at me. I keep my eyes on the teacher hoping she'll do something, but she's one of those who had given up a long time ago, sighed and went on with the lesson like nothing had happened. I decide that when I get to work I'm going to text him to leave me alone because he's scaring me which might please him but I know I need to tell him to stop. If he hadn't looked so out of his mind I might have told him in person but he looks so angry. I rush out of class like always and Brandon blatantly moves slowly as if to show me he's not going to rush after me. I scurry through the masses of people and make it outside just to hear my name as the door begins to close behind Brandon is standing at the door, where I was moments ago, unmoving, just staring at me. The door closes and I rush away, out of eyesight of the doors. I'm so freaked out about it the entire way to work, I compose a long text to Brandon, trying to be nice but firm and telling him to leave me alone. That evening, I unsilenced his notification while I'm at work and continue to anxiously glance at my phone, waiting for his response back, but for hours I don't hear anything. It's not until 9pm when business has gotten slow that my phone begins to blow up with notifications. It's a bunch of horror movie gifts with words and bloody letters saying things like, I'm going to get you, look outside, it's time, and my throat tightens. I look up at the monitor into the security camera footage but other than the area immediately around the gas pumps the rest of the parking lot is dark. I look down at my screen again and he sent... I see you. And with that I heard a loud smashing noise from outside that practically made me fall off the counter. I shakily grabbed the keys to lock the front door and looked towards the security footage again. Of course, the bang came from the one side of the building without a camera. Nope, not going out there. I still have over an hour until I close and I'm in no rush to go check it out. And that's when Brandon tries calling me. I immediately answer and he's sobbing. Why won't you let me take you away? I'm stunned by this question, but unsteadily say, Brandon, Brandon, why are you crying? Are, are you the one outside? T please stop. You're freaking me out. I walk to the front glass door, squinting my eyes to look for movement amidst the darkness. Are you out there? I practically whisper into the phone, terrified. Then bang. Brandon standing to the left of the door now, smashing his fist into the glass. I'm calling the police, Brandon. I scream. It's only when I hear Brandon clearly wail again that I realize he was still on the phone with me. He's shaking the other trash can and stomping and screaming, sounding like he's having a full-on tantrum. 
I slam the keys into the door and lock it as Brandon stands feet away, losing his mind. Then silence. With my phone still on speaker, Brennan's voice rings out. You make me feel so much pain. I'm going to make you feel so much pain, too. And before I can threaten to call the police again, he hangs up on me and smacks the door one last time. This was before I had to call the police. I would multiple times to the gas station after this, but to this point I never had before and I was afraid that they wouldn't take me seriously and at this point I was supposed to close soon. So I call my aunt who also works at the gas station and she drives over. By the time she arrives there's less than half an hour until I close and she informs me that there's no sign of anyone. But someone knocked over the trash can and threw the lid into the road 15 feet away on the side with no camera as well as the trash can by the front door being stomped in. I told my aunt what happened and she insisted that when I returned to school that I had to tell someone what happened. So the next day I hesitantly went to the main office and talked to the guidance counselor assigned to my last name, who also happened to be the counselor for Brandon's last name too. When I showed her the messages and told her everything that happened, she really tried to convince me that it wasn't a big deal, that Brandon had mental issues that he suffered from and that if Brandon got suspended again, he wouldn't be able to go here and would likely drop out, emphasizing just how bad that would be for him. I didn't know how that was my fault, but she also assured me that she would guide him and that I was graduating in a few short months anyway so I shouldn't destroy Brandon's life, so I dropped it. Brandon didn't come to school for about a week after, and his seat was moved to the other side of the room from me in our shared class. He didn't talk to me for a month. To the week leading up to my 18th birthday and my last month of school, Brandon had seemed more cheerful than normal, and was being friendly, but not even directly towards me. So, I was hoping that something good had changed in Brandon's life. Brandon even randomly apologized to me for his behavior and said that he had gotten super drunk that night when he showed up at the gas station and was sorry about the way he acted. But by my birthday, he was back to acting creepy again. The first thing he said to me on my birthday was, Congratulations, you're 18 now. The police aren't going to take it as seriously when you go missing now. I ignored him and by the end of class I was rushing out like old times to avoid him. The bell rings and I stand up, grabbing my small bag and throwing it over my shoulder, no longer bothering with the backpack. That's why I could directly feel the point shoved into the middle of my back as another hand yanked my head back hard by grabbing my ponytail. I made a startled noise and spun around to see Brandon standing over me, still holding a sharpened stake at me. What are you doing, Brandon? Where'd you get that? And he laughs carefree and said that he can make whatever he wants in his mechanics class. There's still people rushing the class change around us and he continues to brandish the stake at me. Why are you holding a stake up at me? That hurt. His eyes seem to lighten up as I say that last part. He doesn't answer me, instead saying, I could stake you to the wall and keep you as my prize, and continues. You know, I really hate this school. I could end everyone here and not feel anything. Once again, I listen to all the horror podcasts, watch true crime shows, read the news. I know the warning signs, and that was definitely one of them. But my dumb reaction was to act like I was on his side, immediately snapping. What's wrong with you? If you say stuff like that, you're going to get suspended. And he grins at me. The halls are starting to clear and I turn to leave when he grabs me by the wrist and yanks me forward with the stake pointed up against my ribs. I wouldn't want to shoot everyone. I want to gut them. And before I can force myself out of his grip, I hear, Hey! And Brandon pushes me away. Of all the people, it's Mr. B from my last story who is the one who spotted us. Brandon quickly shoves the stake back into his backpack and just glares at me, stomping away. Mr. B looks concerned and asks me, Was that a stake? I just nodded, looking uncomfortable, and Mr. B says, You must be into some pretty dark stuff, Victoria. And my mouth drops in shock, and he walks away with a laugh. 
Nothing came of it, and with so little time left, everything became a blur until my final day. Brandon didn't show up to school, but one of his friends was waiting for me at the door as I left and gave me a super long notebook from Brandon. The first five pages were nothing but sketch after sketch of me, some of them immediately making me uncomfortable because of the provocative positions he had drawn me in. I glanced at the pages, ramblings about wanting me, wanting to hurt me, wanting to save me, wanting me to be his forever. I stand there less than five minutes, looking over it all before I moved away from the high school for the last time and throw away all the papers into the nearby bin. It was only coincidentally that a year later I got an update on him. I graduated a year early as I said, so a year later I had my twin sister's graduation to go to. It was while taking our seats before the ceremony that I heard the larger couple directly in front of us talking about what a miracle it was that their son, Brandon, had made it to graduation. I'm not normally nosy, but as soon as I had confirmation that these were creepy Brandon's parents, I heard his mother say, I really wasn't sure after that girl last year that he'd make it to this day. I'd never seen him like that. He spent all summer just staring at the wall, unblinking. Now I have no way of knowing if there was some other girl that Brandon really cared for around the same time I had my issues with him. He would go on telling me anything and everything, so it would surprise me to know if there was someone else he talked to. He made it sound like I was the only person ever remotely nice to him. But I'd rather not be the reason for Brandon's misery. I hardly knew him. And despite what he thought, he hardly knew me. So I'm an actress, but I'm still in college and do a lot of other things to supplement my income. Makeup, writing, dressing, a day job, etc. My last theater job was working as a dresser because the show involved three six-foot-something men having to be put in corsets and period piece drag, which included huge wigs and they needed all the help that they could get. It was hard work, but a lot of fun. This particular theater does late night shows and I don't have a car so I always took public transportation there and home. Shows would end around 10, then I'd catch a train that would take me as close to home as possible before I call a lift. The train ride was about 45 to 50 minutes so by the time I got home it was around midnight, then I'd have to get up the next morning at 7am to go to school. It was tiring but I felt so happy to be making money doing what I loved so I didn't care. One night near the end of the production, I made my way to the train station under the watchful eye of one of my cast, and I got on the train no problem. As I mentioned, it's a long train ride, and the line I ride goes through some unsavory parts of town. If you're from Dallas, I'm sure you're familiar with West End. It's a gathering place for drugs and homeless people. I've taken the bus and train since I was very young, so people like this didn't bother me none. They're still human beings and deserve to be treated as such. As usual, I listened to music, but I kept the volume low enough so I could hear what was going on around me. It was West End Station that a man got on. He was unhealthily skinny, dark skin with his head shaved. He was a good-looking guy, but one look in his eyes and he was obviously out of it. Right behind him was an older white woman. It was cold, so she had a scarf wrapped around her face and I could only see her blue eyes and blonde hair sticking out from underneath her knit hat. I was seated in the type of train seat where you sit sideways rather than forward. I usually pick these seats because I have long legs, and to be fair, I had a backpack and a big metal makeup case. Your girl needs space. The older woman sat in the forward-facing seat to my left, and the super out-of-it guy sat across from me. It was around 11.20pm and I'm sitting there thinking, why do these people sit right next to and across from me? I enjoy having a car to myself, especially since I'm theatrical and like to sing along to my music. I gave them both a polite nod and went back to my business. Something told me to get up and move, but I was tired from school and work and knowing I'd have to do it all again the next day made me reluctant to move, so I stayed. If you've read any of my other stories, you'll... No, I'm an empath, so of course I could feel the guy staring at me. 
I may be introverted, but I was raised by a Scottish-Irish no-nonsense extrovert who taught me to stand up for myself, so with a frown I said, What? The guy shrugged and said nothing, so I went back to my music again. It was then that he started mouthing something. He was clearly really messed up, so I looked at him again, clearly starting to get annoyed. I've worked retail a long time, so I've learned to control my face in work-related situations. However, if I'm in public, my attitude will come out. I was tired and didn't want to get into a confrontation, so I started to ignore him. At some point, he slammed on something and shouted, Look at me. His voice was deep and echoed off the walls. Now, he wouldn't know this, but because of an abusive stepfather, slamming is a trigger for me. I tensed up, feeling like I was 16 and ready to start crying, but I quickly shoved that back to deal with later. At that point, anger started pulling in my mouth. I looked at him and said, It's not a nice way to get someone's attention. I grew up around stoners and treating them like children when they were out of it. It was a habit, so I resulted to that. I slowly moved my hand into my pocket, clutching my pocket knife at this point. He apologized and moved closer, squeezing himself next to my makeup case. Can I ask you something? Will you be honest? I nodded, going along with what he had to say. He talked about how everyone in his life only wanted to use him. I don't know why I tried to give this guy genuine advice, but I asked him, You sure you want me to be honest? He nodded, taking out a pen to doodle on my makeup case. I wasn't pleased with this, but I kept talking. I told him that he needed to sit back and think and decide if it was really worth keeping those people in his life. He nodded in agreement before he started babbling about some nonsense about a home run in his life. He then told me the next stop was his. I caught his eye and said, Is there anyone I can call to help you out? He nodded and said, Yeah, my nurse. He fumbled in his pocket, looking for what I assumed was a card or something. He pulled out another pen and stared at it for a full three minutes unblinking. I don't know how my patience stayed intact, but I said, Sir? He responds, Hmm? And I said, Can I have your nurse's phone number? You wanted me to call her. At that moment, he let out a small laugh and said, Nah, no, no, it doesn't matter. I just blinked at him and suddenly he was upset again, asking why life was so hard. I simply told him I didn't know, but we were at his stop. He suddenly looked suspicious and asked how I knew that. You just told me. Was all I said. Keeping my tone even, I repeated my last statements multiple times before he suddenly stood and moved to the door. He looked back at me one last time before running away to God knows where. At this point, I turned to look at the older woman who was still sitting on my left and she looked, I don't know, impressed or shocked I guess. I'm baby faced so most people think I'm around 16 even though I'm 27. I suppose she was no different and was wondering how someone so young had kept her composure throughout such an encounter and maybe she sat so close to me to keep an eye on me or something I didn't realize. I still have those pen markings on my makeup case as a reminder and while I think I handled the situation alright, it irritates me that this guy had the nerve to get close to me, a complete stranger, and ask me to solve all of his problems, and it angers me that I was full on ready to stab someone. I don't want to hurt anyone, I don't like violence, but I hate my personal space being invaded, so he'd clearly put me in fight mode. To the guy who was strung out on something, I hope you get your stuff together, for the sake of your nurse if nobody else. When I was about 8 years old, my sister, who was 18 at the time, brought home her new boyfriend. He was around 30 years old, which concerned my mom, but it wasn't abnormal for my sister to do this. At this point in her life, she was falling rapidly into a deep depression. Drugs and one night stands were very common at this time for her, so an actual boyfriend seemed better than my mom not knowing where she was every night. Boyfriend was very nice to us, and especially to me. He and my sister took me to different places. He bought quite expensive gifts for me, and my 8 year old self liked him very much for this of course. This will be relevant later. 
I even went to his house for a sleepover, but of course my sister was there with me. I should tell you that I never got any creepy vibes from him. He never said anything weird or creepy as far as I can remember. Fast forward to the day they broke up. It's quite a blur, so I don't remember all of it, but I do remember him showing up at our house and my sister refusing to let him in. My mom wasn't home, but it was still light out and luckily we're very close with our neighbors. My other sister, she was around 13 or 14, kind of locked herself in her room, but every now and then she'd walk up to our older sister and ask, Has he left yet? Now I was a very curious kid and I had no clue what was going on. I saw my older sister was very distraught and very snappy towards me. Understandable considering I was constantly following her and asking questions. I remember looking out my mom's window while my sister tried to push my head out of sight. Boyfriend yelled at her that he had come all this way, he lived about an hour away, and something about the police, though I can't remember what, he left shortly after. Years later, I thought of this evening and finally asked my mom about it, and what she told me left me in shock. Apparently my sister had found very inappropriate pictures of children on his phone. It still gives me shivers thinking about how nice he was and why my sister tried to keep me out of view that night. I live in the Philippines, and for some context, I am currently in college taking up a bachelor's degree in one of the oldest universities in Asia. My school was founded by the year 1600 during the Spanish colonial era, so my university is pretty old and it's being managed by the Catholic Church. If you're from the Philippines, you'll probably know what school this is. I have a night class at one of the oldest original buildings of our university. We are only eight students attending that particular class because it's currently typhoon season that time and most of my classmates are absent. My professor called our name one by one for our class attendance, when suddenly he shouted, Hey you, mister. At the back, why don't you take a seat up front, since most of the seats are not occupied? At first we ignored it, thinking it's one of the irregular students that is attending our class, so we just shrugged it off. Then my professor shouted again. Excuse me, are you deaf? And could you please take your jacket hood down, please? Now in a very serious tone. This time me and my classmates paid attention to the mysterious man at the back. Because our professor is now furious and finally decided to check on our mysterious classmate, suddenly, the lights went out for a few minutes. During the blackout, we were suddenly struck by a cold breeze, even though all the windows are closed because it was raining crazy this time of year. After a few minutes, the electricity finally came back, and to our surprise, when we looked at the back, the mysterious man wasn't there anymore. There's an eerie moment of silence after that, when my classmate finally asked the professor where that man went, our professor was so speechless that he suddenly just decided to cancel class. I had been debating for some time if I should share this story or not. However, after having a short conversation with my parents about the events, I have decided to write it down. Before going into the story, I would like to say that as much as I, my family, and extended family like to joke about calling ourselves witches, we know there's some kind of small gift given to the women in particular. We mostly believe it to be just stronger intuition, but sometimes I and some others do hear a, let's say, whisper in the back of our minds that might give a surprising but correct answer. Now to the story. It happened in 1991. Back then I wasn't even born. Not sure if I was even a thought, but my country had been in independence from the Soviet Union for about a year. Lithuania was the first, but others joined soon after. Yet, travels among former Soviet Union countries were not difficult back then. My parents had decided to visit my uncle, who got happily married years prior and moved to a small town in Russia. It was supposed to just be a small visit to celebrate my parents' recent wedding and then quickly return home. However, that day was different. 
My aunt had a worried look on her face, and although she couldn't really tell what was wrong, she begged my parents to stay the night and leave in the morning. Normally, when my parents visited, they would head back home during the nighttime because there was less cars on the road and the weather was nicer, in hopes that when they reach the Lithuanian borders, procedures will go much faster. For once, my parents agreed to stay. It was only around midday when they were at the border that they noticed that something was very wrong. There were police officers who were redirecting cars, showing us just to drive. When my parents reached home, they got the news what happened. The staff of the border station in Medininkai had been massacred. Seven people died and only one survived. There isn't much details given to the public, but what is known that it all happened during the night. Today, this event is known as the Medininkai Massacre. Had my parents decided to leave that night, there would have been a change that they would have been in the middle of the events. There could have been nine people instead. Just thinking about it gives me goosebumps, she said, and I can't blame her. Only now, nearly 30 years later, did my mom wonder why she agreed to stay that night. She believes that some guardians of the family from both my mom's and aunt's side decided that it wasn't my parents' time and tried their best to keep them safe. Although there's a huge language barrier between me and my aunt, I will forever be thankful for her. If it weren't for her and the bad feeling that she had that day, my parents would have likely been among the casualties and I wouldn't be here today. First of all, I would like to say that I am not the only victim of this person. This is just a recount of my experiences being harassed and stalked by this guy. Junior year, I began getting followed on social media by a ton of fake accounts. These accounts would go after the hot girls at my high school. A double-edged sword, I was included in this group. At first, it was just a bunch of message requests, which could easily be ignored. Then, one morning... I woke up to the sight of one of the most disgusting things I had ever seen, worse than when I was tricked into watching two girls one cup in middle school. I had been tagged in a picture of a micro wiener that I can only assume this garbage had. I mean, this thing looked like if a baby elephant in the womb had a growth stunt that affected its trunk. Gross. Untagged, blocked, reported. The account was deleted eventually and all was well in my 16-year-old world for a while after. Beginning my senior year, more of these accounts began to pop up, this time impersonating people at our school. I began getting threats almost daily from different users posing as my fellow classmates about how they were going to send inappropriate photos of me to my family, college, and post them to the internet if I didn't do as asked, which was to send explicit photos of myself. I also received a threat about sending a photo of me hitting a jewel to my college, which I thought was hilarious but scary at the time due to the fact that the photo was only saved on my Snapchat memories. I've never been a mean girl, but when someone crosses me with threats, I leap into fight mode. I didn't have any illicit photos, so I knew he was bluffing, but still played along at first to see what he wanted from me. Fortunately for me, the guy wasn't too bright. I ended up telling at least 15 of these accounts that I knew that they were bluffing and to cut the act as if there were multiple different people at our school. Not to mention, it was eerie that he obtained this photo of me jeweling that I had not posted to any form of social media. I graduate and I'm not too concerned about it anymore since I knew I was going off to college soon. However, he took it up a notch that summer, hacking multiple girls' social media accounts and even got his hands on one of my friend's illicit photos that was saved in her My Eyes Only section of Snapchat and sent it to me, pretending to be her to coerce explicit photos out of me. About a week later, his IP address was traced. It turned out to be a guy in my graduating class, and he was charged with 21 counts of underage photographs and coercion. The threats and fake accounts ended for a while, but after he was released from jail at the end of my freshman year of college, I received a random ad from one of the common aliases he used on Snapchat. Thankfully, I still had the screenshots of the messages he sent under the same alias years back. I was always friends with some of the other victims, but they had not been added by the account. 
I reported all the evidence to the police and ended up being the whistleblower to his probation violation which led to his arrest again. It still creeps me out to this day that he persisted for years to try and solicit explicit photos from teenage girls and how I passed him in the halls without knowing he was the one that was attempting to blackmail me for pleasure. And not to forget, he was also photoshopping the faces of minors onto certain selfies of actual women. Just such a weirdo. I'm an 18-year-old female who lives in Victoria, Australia. I recently moved down by myself into a two-bedroom unit with three other units in the complex. The way the complex is set out is the four units are to the left side with a driveway down the right and a carport leading down the back. My neighbors are all single males who work long hours, so I have never met them before. One night I got home from work at about 6.30pm, so it was already quite dark. I parked my car in the carport and turned my front light on from my phone while I walked the 10 meters to the front door. There were no other lights to show where to go, so I used it to see more than anything else. I was walking to the gate that conceals my front door when I heard a sniffling sound coming from behind the gate. I paused, wondering if maybe it was an animal like a possum or a cat, and slowly made my way back to my car, not wanting to scare it so that it jumps out at me. I called my parents who live about five minutes away and asked my dad to come have a look. I'm a very cautious and paranoid person, so I get spooked by things like this quite easily. After about ten minutes, my dad arrives and pulls up to the driveway next to the gate. He's a pretty big guy who boxed and can throw a wicked punch, so I instantly felt safer with him there. My dad opened the gate and a fist flew around the corner, narrowly missing my dad's right shoulder. My dad yelled, threw a punch, and knocked out a skinny man who looked as though he was a junkie or possibly homeless. We called the police and he was arrested. This happened a few weeks ago and whilst I'm not as shaken up by it as I was then, I am still nervous that every time I get home, someone will be waiting behind that gate. This one happened just a few hours ago and it scared me. So, I was on a bike ride and while I was biking up to the trail I bike on, there was a car parked in front of it. Normally I wouldn't think much of it, but this trail was in a pretty shady part of town. Nothing too bad, just not the place you would go camping. Anyways, I went past the car and started down the trail. After a while, I heard a car behind me and so I went into the side of the road to let the car pass. When I looked at the car, it was the same one from before, but... When I went to the side of the trail, the car stopped. Okay, weird, I thought, and moved on. But then as soon as I started again, so did the car. This is when I started to get a little bit scared. I do know a lot about cars, so knowing that this Ford Explorer would not be able to go off-road, I went into a smaller trail for bikes. After doing that, I heard car doors slamming and people yelling, Where are you? and running coming towards me. Now I was biking as fast as I could and luckily made it out of there, but while riding to my house I saw the car again. They were able to easily recognize me because I was wearing baggy pants and a Santa Cruz hoodie. And so they started to drive towards me slowly, but I just rode back down into the trail I had just come from and I don't think they saw me because nobody came after me. After I called the cops and they asked me if there was a license plate and I said not that I could see. They just said, okay, call us again if it happens once more. And that was pretty much it, but terrifying nonetheless. I don't know what they wanted, but it obviously couldn't have been good. Hi, my name is Jake. I remember when I was five or six, I was waiting outside my house for my mum to come outside to bring me to swimming lessons. So I was just standing there, and the next thing I knew, there was a blonde-haired woman wearing a black coat and hat walking in my direction. Now, I used to live in an estate, from which we moved from, and on my side at the end of the road, you had to turn a corner to get out of the estate by car. 
Anyway, when the woman gets to me, we'll call her Karen, she asks me, Hey there, what's your name, little boy? Me, being a dumb kid that I was, says, Jake. Karen smiled and responded with, Ah, oh, cool, my son is also called Jake. Say, want to come with me and play with him? I told her that I had swimming lessons, so it could only be for a little while. She said that was fine and began to lead me to the end of the footpath where the corner was. When we got to the corner, Karen points at a young man wearing a hoodie and dirty tracksuit bottoms and says, That's my son. Go and introduce yourself. Up until now, I had been expecting another boy my age. Not an adult man like I was being shown. Karen's son looked to be roughly around the ages of 18 to 20. Instead of blonde hair like his mum, he had unkempt, short black hair and, now that I think of it, was probably high on something because his eyes were bloodshot and darting everywhere. When I greeted him with, Hi, my name's Jake, he responded by flashing me the most gross-looking, creepy grin ever. At that point, my mum had come out of the house and called me to get in the car because I have swimming lessons. I ran off to the car and as we went around the corner, we passed Karen and her son. They looked like they were arguing about something. But the thing that's chilling about this story is when we got back from swimming lessons, there were police cars all over the estate. My mum asked our neighbor what happened and she said a man and a woman had tried to lure a kid out of the estate with them. A few years later, I found out from a buddy of mine whose father was a policeman assigned to the case that the man and woman arrested were Karen and her son. Karen had been pretending to be a mother looking for a child to play with her son so that they could lure kids out of the park to do God knows what with them. I'm very glad to have my mom and dad to protect me from these types of things, and incredibly grateful towards them. My first few paranormal experiences happened in my family's, my ma'am, brother, and dad's first house. I think I was about three at the time. When I think back to our first house, I remember it to be a dark and not a very bright house for some reason. Even though it was like any other house, it had windows in every room and mostly the rooms were small, so you would assume each room would be brightly lit. My first experience I remember in that house was when I was lying in bed ready to go to sleep. My bed faced the window and I kept my curtains open because I liked to watch the sky. It helped me fall asleep, but that night I was watching a silhouetted figure in front of the window. I don't think I was scared. I didn't even think anything of it. Another night I was laying in my bed and watching my door to the landing and I remember a dark silhouette walk by my bedroom door. I speak to my ma'am about our first house a few times and she tells me about her paranormal experiences in that house. Not long after my ma'am lost my little sister through birth, my little brother was asleep in his travel cot. He would look and point at the ceiling laughing, saying baby over and over again. His toys would also go off and on. When my ma'am was in the sitting room, the room would go cold and feel as if though she was being watched. She said to me that she feels as if it was an older man's presence. A couple of years go by in that house and my ma'am decides to move due to my dad walking out on us and financial problems. In our second house, I was trying to fall asleep on the couch because my ma'am would have to keep my brother upstairs and me downstairs because... When we were upstairs together, we would play on our PlayStation 2 together, or we would be hyper all night and not go to sleep, so she had to keep an eye on us when it was time for us to go to sleep when she was ready to go to bed. She would carry me up to bed, but anyway, when I was trying to sleep, I was staring at the TV and I watched the silhouette walk by the TV. Yet again, it never scared me. When I think about the silhouette, I think about my great-grandma, my granddad's ma'am. She passed away a few weeks after my sister passed away at birth. My nana thinks that she was taken from us to look after my sister. I haven't seen any silhouette after moving into our third house back in 2010. I have had a few strange experiences. My grandma's husky storm passed away in 2014. I was very close to my grandma's dog because I grew up around them. In 2017, I was at Drayton Manor theme park when... 
a white feather fell on my shoulder. I did a shrug to get it off because we were outside and it could have come from a bird. A few hours passed by and we were ready to leave. I go to the gift shop and look at the little animal teddies and I notice that there are no husky ones left, but I get a feeling to pick up a tiger teddy and behind it was a husky teddy, so I picked it up and read the name tag of the teddy and I just froze in shock. The name of the husky teddy was Storm. My mom also caught her dog Diesel barking at the steps and possible orbs floating around on camera. I have also been to a spiritualist church and was told that they can see an older lady and a little girl by my side. I would like to add that none of these experiences have frightened me in any way, and if anything, I feel like my family members who have passed away are still with me. I went on a cruise ship with my friends. We left in Miami and were going to the Bahamas and returning within three days. I should mention, we hadn't gone on a cruise ship before, and mostly just wanted to swim and hang out in the club area of the ship. We had booked two double bedrooms for the four of us. As we were walking to our rooms after checking in, I noticed two men down the hall on our level talking. One of them looked over at me and smiled, and his friend joined him. I didn't really want to smile back, but they caught me by surprise, so I just smiled back without thinking. We went into our rooms and started unpacking. After about an hour, we went downstairs to the pool area, and the first person I see is the guy from the hallway before. He laughed at me and said, are you following me? I thought he was just trying to flirt, so I basically ignored him. We went into the pool and walked around a little before going back upstairs to shower and get ready to go to dinner. I got ready and I had a fun time at the restaurant with all my friends. After we finished eating, my friends wanted to check out the club and since it was our first night, I thought why not. We walked to the club area and there were lots of people. One of my friends, Sarah, said she was going to go to the bar and get some drinks. We found a spot to sit. Not five minutes after we sat down, those two guys walked in, and of course he straight away looked at me and gave me that same annoying smile. I went back on my phone, trying to make it clear I wasn't interested. They walked, and I enjoyed the rest of my night there without seeing them again. I didn't end up seeing them again until we left the club, and on our way back I spotted them talking at a quiet section of the boat. They were obviously really drunk, and they looked over at me and my friends and started yelling at us to come and sit with them. We started walking the other way, but heard them following us. As we got upstairs, the men came up behind us and started saying rude things to us in their drunken voices. One of my friends, Sarah, is the strongest one of us in the group. She told them to leave us alone and wasn't afraid of them at all since she's trained in martial arts herself. We got back to our rooms and tried to forget about it. I didn't end up seeing them the next day or night. It wasn't until the final day on the ship that I found out that two men had been arrested for fighting and one of them had a knife on him when they were handcuffed. I'm so glad I had Sarah with me that night, otherwise there's no telling what their intentions were with me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and you can give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.